Good morning everybody, I am the Cynic. For a long time I've been wanting to know how and why evolution works the way it does. The differences between evolution and adaptation, as well as the inherent effects evolution has upon the human brain, all subsequent variants therein, to find out how the human species can be optimized in order to achieve the universally acclaimed better world. Another topic, that, another topic that's held my interest has always been the relationship between men and women. Why single mothers were a thing, why women chose the men they chose, and why men chose the women that they chose, so on and so forth. Men going their own way cover both gender relations as well as overall human behavior, giving more credence to the former as opposed to the latter. But still, the interest, information, reason, rationality, and theorizing was there, and still is. Most MGTOW subscribe to the idea of Darwinian theory, which is the theory that natural selection, aka sexual selection, accumulates traits and variants of any given species and utilizes the useful traits as beneficial and to be selected by members of said species for copulation and reproduction, leaving the undesirable variants of the species to die off without producing offspring. Variants are the subtle and overt differences between each individual organism despite being part of the same species, in this regard anyway. An example of this would be race, hair color, and thickness, differing height and facial structures, as well as some qualities of quote-unquote alpha versus beta behavioral traits. Evolution and human behaviors play a large role in men going their own way. Yes, while our primary concern in moth lights may be in pertinence to how evolution has shaped the interactions between the sexes, it has also become an interest as to the overall cultivation of the human species as it is today. Though, I've noticed a strange vocabulary used whenever the idea of Darwinian theory and sexual selection is put into place. To give you a little insight into what I mean, whenever most people speak on the concept of evolution, it's usually in context of purpose or intent, instead of consequential outcome. Statements akin to, humans evolved X variable in order to heighten their offspring's survival probability, insinuating that the variable was intentional on part of the organism or group, instead of some humans developed X variable and consequently had a higher survival and continuation probability. Like saying, black people evolved to have darker skin because of their environment, instead of black people have darker skin because it was the dominant genetic inclination. The former language, to me, indicates not Darwinian evolutionary theory, but Lamarckian evolutionary theory. Now, what is Lamarckian evolutionary theory, you might ask? In 1809, the French biologist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck published his theory in a book called Philosophie Zoolique, or Philosophical Zoology that would later become known as Lamarckism. In the book, Lamarck names two supposed laws that would enable animal species to acquire characteristics under the influence of their environment. The first law stated that the use or disuse would cause body structures to grow or shrink over the generations. The second law asserted that such changes would be inherited. Those conditions together imply that the specimens or that the species continuously changes by adaptation to their environment, forming a branching series of evolutionary pathways. Lamarckian theory revolves around the idea that organisms garner variables via observing and interacting with their environment from their own perspectives, analyzing problems like food acquirement slash scarcity, predators slash prey, and through use slash disuse of traits and characteristics beneficial to that organism, would pass on the desired traits through quote unquote soft irritability to their offspring, making them more fit to survive in the environment, and building on the complexity of that organism from the simpler bodies of their predecessors. The most popular way to describe this is the giraffe, 
wherein the earlier generations of the organism observed that there was more food to be found at the tops of trees, and would stretch out their necks to get set foodstuffs, straining the muscles within their necks to reach, and through the strain and use, use being the primary word there, passing on the, through soft inheritance of that muscle use imperative to their offspring, giving said next generation the inclination for longer necks with each generation continuing this process until the length of the neck became suitable as to no longer require strain and growth. Of course, the obvious issue with that is that, if this were the case, extinction of a species or the death of any line of variant would be much lower than what it is, since all organisms would observe various survival issues with their within their environment and evolve slash adapt in accordance. <clears throat> Darwinian theory revolves around natural selection wherein the traits that lead to higher survival probability and successful sexual selection rates are the traits that continue on. Whilst Darwin took some of Lamarck's findings into account and acknowledged the idea of use-slash-disuse in terms of genetic continuance, it was not in terms of the individual organism, but a subsequent subclass of the species mixing the alleles of their DNA and through dominant hereditary genes overpowering the lesser recessive alleles and morphing into something else through that synthesis of inherited variants. Where Darwin differs from, Lamar from Lamarck is that while Lamarck believes variants come from a place of use and disuse intent on the organism, leading to their change by a type of subconscious desire, Darwin does not believe this to be the case, and it's a little muddled on what he does believe causes variants. Contrary to what many believe, myself included, Darwin did not believe that chance and random genetic mutations were the primary cause of variants in a species. According to his book titled On the Origin of Species, he had denounced the matter entirely by saying, <clears throat> quote, I have hitherto sometimes spoken as if the variations so common in multiform with organic beings under domestication and in lesser degree with those in a state of nature have been due to chance this of course is a wholeheartedly incorrect expression but it serves to acknowledge plainly our ignorance of the cause of each particular variation unquote. unfortunately i was not able to confidently discern what Darwin thought caused variations at all. And this, unfortunately, leads me to report that I cannot safely say what he believed against Lamarckian theory, since he placed more emphasis on natural selection and the continuance and mixing of variants in the dominant allele over what caused the variants in the first place. What I can say is that Darwinian followers subscribe to adaptation and the continuance of beneficial traits, mixing in with one another to produce a superior being than what the parents were before. To clarify, the variance of a trait between individual organisms is not intentional on part of the parent or organism itself, but mere choice on part of sexual selection, with organisms who hold beneficial traits surviving, not because they've chosen the trait, but because they had them. And to simplify it, Darwin believes variants are incidental, while Lamarck believes them intentional. In this, the language of intended evolution is redundant to apply to Darwinian theory. Animals don't evolve intentionally to survive. They just happen to gain the traits that lead them to do so through sexual selection. I'm, it's a small nitpick on my part, and one that may not even really apply since the word Darwin isn't thrown around a lot, but one that I wanted to address because it, it gives a false narrative of controllable evolution when the primary theory is that evolution is not controllable. It can be somewhat influenced by withholding copulation from those with undesirable variants and creating envi uh, environments that favor certain variants, but it cannot force the alterations desired to manifest. All that can be hoped for is that the wished traits will happen to occur through hybrid copulation, prior to the environment killing the specimens or leading said specimens down a different path of evolution and variants. You can place a bunch of rats into an environment which will make it beneficial for them to sprout wings and fly, but you cannot make them sprout wings and fly just because they are in such an environment. Now, is this 100% true that 
the environment holds less sway over the individual organism's variations, and that all evolutionary alterations are the result of genetic synthesis of dominant and recessive alleles? I do not believe so. I think random genetic mutations play a much bigger role in this equation than most are willing to admit. But I'm no evolutionary biologist either. I'm just some guy on the internet who's trying to figure shit out, learning what I can and trying to piece together what I can to the best of my ability, and am willfully admitting that my knowledge on the matter is limited at best. Now all of this leads me to this. Biological determinism, or naturalistic inclination, whilst not the sole drive of human behavior, does hold a precedent in terms of sexual selection and reproduction. The lizard brain holding the types of instincts, where the mammalian brain holding the inclination for socialization and prolonged child rearing, and the neo-mammalian brain holding inclinations toward complicated matters of social and cultural normalcy. That's my speculation hypothesis anyway. I'm open to being proven wrong at any given time. I think I've mentioned this before. <clears throat> now, the reason I make this video is twofold. Well, actually threefold. One is the idea that human animals may have their inclinations of hypergamy and sexual selection dissuaded from the reptilian brain by the neomammalian brain of reason and thought. I find this supposition invalid in that monogamous relationships have been pressed throughout most of the world for at least the past few centuries and for many years before that. Yet the social contract of monogamy, despite the societal benefit of maintaining monogamy, hasn't held sway once a more convenient method of survival, state-sanctioned wealth redistribution, came into effect evidenced by the unprecedented divorce rate and falling marriage rates in today's Western society. The phrase, you can't help who you love, slash who you are attracted to, being more prudent than most advocates of the concept of love are willing to admit to, as well as the fact that no matter in which individuals may breed, the inclination towards hypergamy exists within, I would say, every single human being. The genetic makeup for it is there, and no matter where you get the allele, it is still, on some level, based in favor of hypergamy. And the second is to clarify, at least in terms of Darwinian theory, the idea of controllable evolution. Now, understand this isn't my attempt to tone police or nitpick on others for the words they use. The differences in language is subtle, extremely subtle, enough to the point I'd say it's almost irrelevant. Though, I will say it's an important distinction to make in terms of comprehensive analysis for those interested in the complex and fundamental understanding of the theory of sexual selection and evolution as we understand it. Evolution, in accordance with Darwin, is not a place of purpose, but a place of happy and unhappy biological sexual competition. Is this to say, is this to say that the full and unbiased truth of the matter? I don't know. I can't say with 100% certainty that it is. As evolving humans, as we are today, from what we were is an impossible experiment to reproduce. I believe it's the truth, but remain hesitant to say that it's the absolute truth, with absolute conviction. Much in the way I do not believe in God, but will never say with 100% certainty that he, she, it, they do not exist, because the omnipresent deities of biblical power slash the various gods of other religions, such as Zeus or Thor and whatnot, and the sects that pertain to these religions and gods, have yet to be observed or disproven. It's just that they are very unlikely from the evidence I have been presented with. And the third reason is for criticism and commentary. Now, I usually don't ask for comments on my videos or thumbs up or subscribe because, personally, I find these panderings and beggings to be tasteless and unattractive. My videos will speak for themselves if it's worth a like or subscription. Though, in this particular video, I would like some feedback and criticism since this is my primary theory on evolution and how the relationships between the sexes will not and cannot ever change on a, subs on a subconscious and genetic level simply because we want them to. Call it biological determinism if you wish, but I'm going with what makes more sense. What men and women find attractive, legitimately instinctually attractive, barring the exceptions to the rule with fetishes, philias, and whatnot, 
will not change by appealing to the gray matter brain, as the gray matter brain does not dictate what we believe to be desirable, healthy, fertile bodies that may bear children. Well, that wraps up this video. Again, I am no biologist or expert on evolution. These are just my thoughts and opinions taken from various sources listed below. Yes, some of them are Wikipedia links, but most of those are just introductions to variants in evolutionary synthesis. Uh, I'd appreciate the comments, guys. I am the Cynic, everybody. Have a nice day.